Side 4, Objective Bajor, by John Peel. Continuing on page 123. Forgotten. Shakar could hardly believe this. How could he have forgotten Jaro's abortive coup two years earlier? No, but we had hoped that someone had murdered you. Dear me, such hostility. Jaro shook his head in mock sadness. No, I have been in retirement, preparing myself for the time my day would come again. Carr's eyes darted from Jaro to Wynn. They had worked together on the attempted coup, he knew, but nothing had been proven against the Kai. Are you two attempting another takeover of Bajor? He asked, almost laughing. If so, you could hardly have chosen a worse time. In a week, Bajor will most likely no longer exist. This is no revolution, Wynne said, trying to look shocked at the accusation. Did you not hear my words? Two shall convert. Him? Shakar looked at the arch-traitor with loathing. I know it may sound a little difficult to believe. Jaro said smoothly, but the Kai is correct. I am not here to fight you, but our joint enemies. I will throw in my forces and my weapons with yours. Working together, the three of us should be able to better defend Bajor than we could if we did not cooperate. Surely even you can see that, Shakar. Fighting back his desire to throw Jaro out of the window or into a jail cell, Shakar forced himself to think. You want to help. That is all. Jero spread his hands in a smile. And afterward, probed Shakar. Immunity? A place in the government? What is your price? I have no price, Jero answered. I can see that you find this difficult to believe, but in this instance it is true. He raised his eyebrows. May I be frank with you? Please do, Shakar said sarcastically. Jero inclined his head. It is true that I think I am the best man for the seat you occupy. I always will think so. But that seat is of no use to either of us if Bajor no longer exists. Thus, while there is this threat to Bajor... I propose a truce between us all, so that we may join our efforts into a unified defense against the invaders. After we defeat them, then we can begin to fight among ourselves again. For now, let us forget all politics but the one aim of saving the world that we all love. What do you say, Shakar? Shakar considered his options. Much as he distrusted them both, Wynn and Jero both had valid points. Divided, their forces and efforts would be next to useless. Together, well, they might not win the upcoming battle, but at least they'd stand a chance. Shakar made his decision. I cannot refuse anyone whose wish it is to save our world, he replied, his heart heavy. I accept your aid while the battle remains to be fought. And I pray to all the prophets that I don't live to regret this decision, he thought bitterly. Jero grasped his forearm in greeting and smiled. Then we are, at least temporarily, on the same side. The one and the two, Kai Wen announced officiously. In their faith, Bajor shall be made whole, she quoted. What can withstand us now? Chapter 15 Do you really think that this will do any good, Benjamin? Sisko blinked and then smiled slightly at Dax. Old man, at the moment I'm willing to grasp at any straws. Besides, I don't think these aliens are really evil. They're just very twisted, Odo observed. They're willing to destroy Bajor and billions of people without even meaning them any harm. 
he growled. How do you ever hope to reason with these people, Captain? By finding some common ground, Sisko answered. I refuse to believe we can't get through to them. This tour may show us what their culture is like, but I'm also praying that it'll show Tork what we're like. And maybe show us some chink in their mental armor that we can penetrate. An admiral goal, Captain, agreed Odo. But I can't help feeling that it may be a futile one. These hive dwellers show very little interest in logic. But Benjamin is right to try, Dax argued. It may be the last chance that Bajor has. I agree, Odo admitted. But I'd prefer a better one. So would I, Sisko confessed. He stroked his chin. Odo, thus far these aliens don't know that you're not one of us. Odo's eyes sparkled. And you'd like to keep it that way, eh? It might be a good idea at that. At that moment, their guide came hurrying back down the short corridor toward them. Considering how short his legs were, Tork managed quite a respectable pace. We are ready to begin now, he announced. I have reserved a travel tube strictly for our use. We can go wherever in the hive you desire. With the exception of secured areas, I am afraid. We quite understand, Sisko said smoothly. To be honest, what I'm most interested in is seeing what your people are like. What the hive is like, in fact. He gestured at the walls of the corridor. This is all we've really seen of the place so far. I hope it isn't all metal walls. Oh, no! exclaimed Tork, aghast. The hive is a place of beauty and culture. He considered for a moment. Perhaps an overview would be best to begin with. He ushered them along the corridor like a fussy mother hen. This is really a remarkable privilege for me, to be allowed to show you around. You are, of course, the first aliens I have ever encountered. They had reached the entrance to some kind of travel vehicle now, and Torque gestured for them to enter. Sisko had to bend slightly to do so, as it was built for the average hive dweller, who was a good foot and a half shorter than he was. Inside was a small driver's position with a control pad and stick, and five of the board-like seats. Torque moved to the controls and glanced back at his passengers. I am sorry that you must stand, he apologized, but it did not occur to us that you would find our seating uncomfortable. It's quite all right, Dax assured him. This way we'll be able to get a better view, assuming there is a view. Oh, yes, he assured her. A very delightful one. Once we are out of the confines of the complex here, his fingers wrapped on the panel, and he seized the control stick firmly. We begin. The travel vehicle moved quite slowly to begin with, and then started to accelerate. The device was almost silent, save for a low hum of a motor. Torque cleared his throat. Please feel free to ask questions, he told them. I will be as frank with you as I can. We have very little to hide from you. Then why do you dislike people who live on planets? Asked Odo, getting straight to the heart of the matter. It sounds like a mania to me, he talked, slightly shut up. I had imagined that you understood the matter fully, since you live on a space station. Do you not find life in space so much better than it could ever be on the surface of a planet? It's different, Dax answered, and it is possible to enjoy both. Surely your race lived on a planet once. Of course, agreed Tork, but we also were unicellular creatures once. We evolved through that and on to further stages in life. Likewise, we have evolved beyond living on planets and into a more natural and fulfilling stage of life. Sisko was starting to understand. And you think that anyone who lives on the surface of a planet by choice is a lower form of intelligent life, then? Is that not logical? asked Tor. It is natural progression. Life begins in the oceans, then moves to the land, 
then into space. To remain in any one place is counter to natural reason. Odo snorted. Then you'd have a hard time comprehending some life forms in our galaxy. Right, agreed Sisko. On Turek 8, for example, there is a species of highly intelligent squid-like creatures that spend all of their lives in the ocean. They have a tremendous civilization, one that has existed for 16,000 years. Tork shook his head. That sounds implausible, he admitted. Though, of course, I accept your word that this civilization does exist. But it must obviously be an inferior one and stagnant. Ah, he exclaimed before they could argue with him. Now we emerge. The travel tube shot out of the featureless tunnel they had been traversing and into the open. Sisko's eyes opened wide as he took in the view before them, and he couldn't suppress a gasp of surprise and admiration. He heard Dax give a similar exclamation and stared raptly out of the large windows of the travel vehicle. The view was panoramic and splendid. Sisko estimated that they were probably about a third of the way down the hive's main axis and a quarter of the way toward the center of the vessel. They were therefore looking down a long tube as they headed what he decided to call south. The walls curved gently upward on either side of them enveloping their world until they met together over their heads. Either there was artificial gravity inside the hive, or else gravity was provided by rotating this inner core, because the hive spread over every available surface. There were buildings all around. They were constructed of crystal and metal, of many varying designs and heights. Towers, minarets, spires, and bridge-like structures abounded. Domes in different hues of the rainbow were scattered about, and walkways on the ground and at higher levels. It was like seeing the promenade of Deep Space Nine multiplied a million fold. Space at irregular and pleasing intervals between the buildings were parks of varying shapes and contents. Trees and tree-like growths abounded also in the cities themselves. There were vines and other climbing plants and thousands upon thousands of floral sites. There were vast rivers running through all of this, and lakes and ponds. One river wound its way directly above their heads. Sisko could make out boats upon the surfaces. There were vast tracts of what appeared to be farmlands, and in the distance, are those mountains? He asked in awe. They could create a view like this any day in a hollow suite. But this one was real. What an engineering feat. Small ones, Torque apologized. Beyond them is the ocean. You have an ocean in this ship, Dax gasped in astonishment. The hive is very large, Torque explained, and we wished to preserve as many diverse habitats of our home world as we could. Sisko shook his head. This has to be one of the greatest engineering projects I've ever witnessed, he confessed. And I've seen many. It was a great and noble work, said Torque with understandable pride. And it is our responsibility to see that it goes on. Down the central axis of the hive were what looked to be small suns blazing away, to provide light and heat for the world within, clearly. Do they always burn? asked Dax. No, Torque replied. We maintain the illusion of day and night within the hive. It was discovered that we function best when given regular light and dark cycles. It's much the same with us, Sisko observed. Part of growing up as a species on a planet, I imagine, he added. You retain some aspects of them, even when they're long gone. And then, above and below them, Sisko saw the dark line that was growing slightly wider all the time. The line where the hive was splitting. Soon there would be two hives, and then one less Bajor. Could we see what is happening where the hive is being split? Sisko asked. Of course, agreed Torque. In fact, one of my friends is assigned to a station at the break. 
He pulled a small computer pad from a recess in his shell and tapped at it for a moment. Sector 1274, he announced. If we visit there, I am sure he will be happy to show you what is being done. Fine, Sisko agreed. Perhaps, once they were there, he might get some idea of the strength and composition of the hive. And, with luck, some idea of what he could do next. Tuke worked quietly and efficiently, completing his task. The worker drones were now set to detonate on his signal to be sent from Harl's comp. The three drones he had selected were all back at work again after being repaired under Harl's authorization. All that was left was to ensure that Harl would be somewhere near the blast zone without a good alibi for what was to follow. Fingering the small tranquilizer dart he had stolen, Took headed for the maintenance dome where Harl was working. He quietly irised the door and glanced around the bay. There were two further drones in for repair, and he could see a shape hunched across one of them, intent on his work. Harl was very good with machinery and was allowed to work unsupervised for the most part, which was perfect for Took's plan. Silently, Took slipped across the floor, checking as he went that the bay actually was empty. Then he carefully ascertained that the lone repairer was in fact Harl. He wanted no last-minute errors here. Perfect. The tranquilizer dart was in his fingers, and Took moved in swiftly. The dart slipped into a gap between Harl's shell plates, and then out again. With a sigh, Harl collapsed forward onto the drone he had been repairing. He hadn't even looked up, so there was no chance Harl had seen who had attacked him. The drug would keep him insensate for about half an hour, which was more than enough time. Pleased with the progress of his plan, Toot exited the repair bay, irising the door closed behind him. He had Harl's comp with him, ready to transmit the lethal signal as soon as he was far enough away not to be affected by the blast. Sisko couldn't restrain his admiration for the hive. How long have you been traveling? He asked Tork. The hive looks almost brand new. We have been scrupulous in checking for errors and in maintenance work, Tork answered. The hive has been in our care for 2,716 generations. Each generation lasts about 200 of your years. Dax raised her eyebrows, impressed. Half a million years, she murmured. And since the start of the flight, you've never known any other world? We need no other worlds, except as resources, Tork answered proudly. The first hive built well, and they knew that the crossing would take this long. It is fortunate that we were not delayed, as we were getting close to the end of our supplies, which is why it was so imperative that we restock. The only problem with restocking, Sisko mused, was that it had involved the annihilation of Durain 4. Magnificent technology, he commented, but a lamentable use for it, to destroy worlds and kill people. Tork looked pained. That is not our intention, he protested. We gave the people of that world a chance to leave. They responded by attacking us. He sighed. Do you not weary of covering the same ground continuously? I keep hoping that we can impress on you what your people have done, Sisko answered. However you attempt to justify it, your hive has murdered half a million people. Tork glared at him. Do you think I do not know that? He asked. I hear their screams in my head all the time. I am not without softer parts, Captain. I do care. But if the choice is between an insane alien species and the Hive, then my duty is clearly to the Hive. It has been that way since the first Hive created the great design, and it must remain that way for us. The great design, echoed Odo. That smacks to me of excuses, not reasons. What is this great design? The travel tube was passing through one of the small forest areas now. Sisko couldn't help admiring the beauty of the setting. 
Outside, adult and young members of the hive were playing and enjoying themselves. There were no doubt lovers walking hand in hand, and parents playing the equivalent of baseball with their children. There would be elderly people watching the young, envying their strength and agility. It was a serene and cheerful picture, if you could forget the darker side of the hive's purposes for a moment. The great design was formulated in the beginning by the members of the first hive, Tork explained in answer to Odo's question. We once lived on a planet, as you surmised. The star that was our sun was unstable, however, and showed signs that it was going to explode. A supernova, Dax muttered. Your science was clearly advanced to be able to detect this so far ahead of time. Yes, agreed Tork. We already had rudimentary space travel capabilities and had explored the stars and worlds closest to our own. None was fit for any kind of life and we had run out of hope of simply moving our population to a safer world. Then the scientists of the first hive evolved a brilliant idea. They proposed taking one of the rocky worlds in our system and converting it into a colony that would be able to travel between the stars. It was risky and audacious, but they were insistent that this was the only hope for our people. Eventually, it was agreed that they be allowed to try. Construction of the hive took almost the full generation, but it was accomplished. Life forms from our world were transported to the hive, and then our population was evacuated. The great design began. Dax frowned. But according to our calculations, the hive has only just entered our galaxy from intergalactic space. It shows that you have come from the direction of what we call the Magellanic Clouds, why did you not simply seek a world in your own galaxy, instead of risking such a dangerous and lengthy crossing? Because, as work was underway on the hive, we finally made contact with an alien species, the first we ever met until a few days ago. They were warlike and aggressive, and had conquered a large part of the Magellanic Cloud. We were forced for the first time to build ships of war to defend ourselves. We won some of the battles, but their strength was far too great for this to continue for long. They pressured us continually, and we knew that we could never hold out. We could not be assured of a refuge in our own galaxy, and therefore the goal was set to make the great crossing here. The hive was launched and began its journey. The enemy could not follow us, as their ships were not able to spend long periods away from fuel. The hive gathers most of its fuel from the thinly stretched material between the stars and the galaxies. Hence the large wings on your ship, Dax commented. They serve as collectors for the intergalactic gases, and no doubt condensers also. Correct, agreed Tork. It is an efficient system that has lasted us well. Between stars instead of between galaxies, matter is more common, and we are gathering reserves. When the split is achieved, both hives will be well fueled. And then what? demanded Odo. You have told us why the great design was necessary, but you still have not told us what it is. There was a sharp ping from the control panel, and Torque glanced down. We are arriving at the work area where Harl labors, he announced. We shall be decelerating. Sisko watched as the travel tube emerged from the forest and recreational area and into what was clearly an industrial complex. Huge machines were moving between the large buildings. Many of them carried flat plates and others bundles of machinery or electronics. Some carried spars and beams and others equipment that Sisko couldn't immediately identify. The buildings themselves were obviously manufacturing these products, which were all heading toward the growing gap. The noise level outside had to be fairly high, but inside their transport tube, Cisco heard barely little more than a low rumble. It's very impressive, Dax remarked. The raw materials are processed here and then converted into whatever is needed to construct the new hives. Here and in a thousand other factory complexes, Tork explained. 
We will be coming closer to the work area. You may suffer some sensory discomfort, so please alert me if you do not feel well. The travel tube finally drew to a halt beside a small platform, and Tork opened the door. As he had warned them, they were immediately assaulted by everything the tube had sheltered them from. There was a rhythmic pounding, the sound of the workings of vast furnaces and engines in the complex they had passed. Transports whirled along the roadways, adding their quota to the noise. It was loud, but not unbearable, and a lot less than Cisco would have expected of such a complex and vast work site. There was an increased level of heat and the smell of molten metals and burned earths from the foundries where the vast deck plates were being cast. Smoke and vapors curled about the buildings. And none of this really impressed Cisco at all. He was too taken in by staring at the gap ahead of him. They were probably a mile or so from the split in the hive, but the gap itself was by now almost that wide. It was pure black without any sign of the stars beyond. On either edge of the gap were legions of machines at work. Huge spider-like welding machines prowled the edge of the area, sparks and flames flying as they worked on melding the new materials with the old. As they passed, other machines scurried in, carrying the braces, beams, and other supports. Smaller welders danced along, fixing the beams into position. There were workers, some in environmental suits, busily measuring, moving, and fixing materials. Trucks crawled in bearing machinery, some of which was apparently movable, and some of which was clearly in place. A vast army of workers and drones were frantically constructing the new material for the twin hives. It was industry and purpose on a scale that Cisco had never before seen. Whatever else the inhabitants of the hive might be, they were certainly engineers extraordinaire. Too bad they needed O'Brien back on the Defiant. He would have adored this. It's very impressive, Odo grumbled. Magnificent almost. Thank you, Torp replied. We are working at our fastest pace to create the two hives. It will be accomplished in a matter of days. I can believe it, Dax said admiringly. The work pace is tremendous. I assume you have force shields in place along the edge of the gap? Yes, to protect the workers, Torp pointed. On the edge itself, only the drones are allowed to lay the plates and weld them. The area is checked for leaks, and then the edge of the field is pushed further out. Those cone-shaped devices you see beside the workers are the generators themselves. Would you like a closer look? If it would not interfere with the work, yes, agreed Sisko. It would be more than acceptable, Tork assured him. My friend Harl should be in the maintenance dome a short way ahead of us. He will be able to explain much more than I can. Please, follow me, and do not stray. It is for your own safety. While the drones are programmed to avoid living beings, I am not entirely certain that they would recognize you as such. Our body chemistries are surely different. Yes, Sisko said with a smile. I am a trifle more thin-skinned than you, I suspect. They followed along behind Tork, who continually pointed out items of interest from integration machines to the bioregenerators that would move in to begin planting and soil processing as soon as the metals had cooled. The outer skin was three layers thick, he explained, to guard against possible leaks into space, and reinforced with force generators to prevent meteorite impact. That's probably why the sensors couldn't get a good reading of the hive, Dax commented to Cisco. The layering effect would reinforce the screen shields, and make readings difficult or impossible. It's all very impressive, Cisco agreed. These people have a tremendous technology. It's a shame their sense of morality isn't as well developed. Odo grunted. I'm not sure that I agree with you, Captain, he said. Cisco raised an eyebrow. You're the one who is putting the most pressure on him, Constable, he pointed out. Because I have a feeling he's going to crack. Odo explained. Tork is quite clearly uncomfortable with what his people have done. He knows what will happen to Bajor and probably Cardassia Prime, too. This does not sit well on his conscience. 
Odo inclined his head slightly. I have a feeling that the pressure I'm applying may well pierce his sense of duty toward the hive. He could come around to our point of view. I'd be very happy if he did, Sisko commented. But will one hive master on our side be enough? The others all seem dead set on their course of action. If one can come around, then possibly more can be persuaded, Odo said. You're the one who insists on using diplomacy to fight this battle, after all. What other options do we have? None, agreed Sisko. Keep up the good work, Constable. I shall. They were now within several hundred yards of the gap. At this distance, the view of space beyond should have been stunning. Sisko was puzzled to note that the screens were opaque. It was as if a vast wall separated them from the gap and space. That was odd, because it was always simpler and more energy efficient to make force screens invisible than to make them solid. Maybe it was to show the workers and drones exactly where the limit was. Or could there be another reason? A gnawing suspicion was starting to grow in his mind. He had assumed that the Hive Master's view of planetary dwellers being insane was simply prejudice. But what if it was more than that? He could hear the movement of the mechanisms behind the screens, but absolutely nothing of their work was visible. Still, there was plenty to see on this side of the barrier. Trucks were drawing in material, and the growing area of open floor created by the drones was starting to fill in with the walls of buildings or the outlines of where parks and even rivers would be. All the workers and machines were evidently following some sort of master plan worked out more than 2,000 generations before. It was astounding. Tork had his small computer out again and tapped into it. Odd, he muttered. Odo turned abruptly. What is? He seemed to be sensing trouble. I'm getting a reading from Harl's comp, Tork explained. It is several units away from here, and he does not reply to my call. Maybe he's resting, suggested Sisko. At this time of day? Unlikely. Tork's snout wrinkled in confusion. Besides, his work area is that maintenance dome ahead of us. He gestured at the 30-foot crimson half-globe. Why would he be over in the factory units? Perhaps we should find him and ask, Odo suggested. That is... The noise of the work was suddenly overwhelmed by the sound of an explosion. Sisko whirled automatically to take in the situation. About half a mile away, one of the drones carrying welding gear was enveloped in an expanding ball of fire. Then the welding gases caught fire, and there was a loud crump, and then a flattened shock wave that slammed through the air. Heat, smoke, stench, and screams all slammed into them at the same instant. The sound of the blast rang in Sisko's ears as he was hurled back into the closet wall. Around him, slivers of metal and crystal flew. He felt his skin slashed in several places, and then a terrific blow in his back as he slammed into the wall. Dazed, he tried to stay on his feet. There was the sound of a second explosion, and then a third. The shock waves flew through the deck plates, hurling Sisko and his companions aside. Flames and gases licked out from the machinery, enveloping the area as they expanded. The sound of shattering machinery and screams seemed to come from everywhere. And then the force wall ahead of them died, showing the vacuum of space beyond and all hell broke loose. Chapter 16 Shaking his head to try and clear the ringing in his ears, Sisko managed to stagger back to his feet. He ran the back of his right hand across his forehead, and it came away sticky with blood. Not too much, though, so he tried to ignore it. His shoulders ached from the blow the wall had dealt him, and he felt slightly disoriented. Otherwise, he was in acceptable condition. Dax, he called. Odo. And as an afterthought, talk. I'm here, Benjamin, Dax replied. She was beside the same wall he had hit, but about twenty feet away. She was cut and bleeding in several places, and there was a red stain on her left leg. 
Despite this, she was struggling to her feet. Cisco hurried across to help her. Rest here, he suggested, but she shrugged off the suggestion impatiently. I'll rest later. She glanced around the wreckage. Have you found Odo or Torque yet? I'm here, came Odo's voice. The shapeshifter abruptly grew into being from a puddle of liquid close by. I am sorry about revealing myself, Captain, but I automatically liquefied when I hit the wall. He was undamaged, naturally. It took a lot to injure the changeling. That's okay, Constable, Sisko answered. This is something of an emergency, obviously. Can you see Torque? It was just so blazing, and an alarm was whooping in the distance. Strangely, all the screams had ceased. Sisko could see the stars through the collapsing barrier. There was no sign of any repair crew or mechs heading to check out the gap. Okay, more important, he snapped. The force field's dropping. Dax? Whipping out her tricorder, Dax scanned the area. It's down to 5% and failing, Benjamin. We've got to do something fast. She winced as she started to move. Ah, uh, could you give me a hand? I don't think I can make it alone. Sisko gripped her around the shoulders and allowed her to lean on him. My pleasure. He glanced back at Odo. See if you can find Torque or any other survivors. Acknowledged. Concentrating on helping Dax limp over to the crackling force generator, Sisko could spare little attention for what was going on around him. There had been some kind of malfunction, obviously. One, no more, of the transports had exploded. But why weren't there rescue crews swarming all over the area? The hive dwellers were so efficient at everything. What had gone so badly awry now? Well, he could worry about that later. Right now, the important thing was to prevent the generator from failing. If it went, then the atmosphere inside the hive would be sucked out into space. There was no way of knowing how many this would kill, but the three of them would certainly be included. Sisko moved to tap his communicator to contact the Defiant, but it was missing. It must have fallen off when he'd been hit by the blast. They reached the conical generator, and Sisko eased Dax against it. Think you can figure it out, old man? he asked. I can figure anything out, she replied, smiling through her obvious pain. In time. Better hope I've got long enough. She started to use her tricorder to scan the machine, the first step in understanding it. I'll be fine if you want to help Odo, she added pointedly. Sisko glanced at her and saw her communicator was gone also. She was lucky to have retained the tricorder, really. That left Odo. He nodded. I'll be back soon. I'll be here, she promised, if I can get this working again. She started to remove one of the panels. Go. He ran back the way they had come. Thick smoke was starting to descend on the entire area from all the fires. No doubt chemicals ignited by the blast caused these. The once level roadway was buckled and shattered in several places, and there were now large chunks of metal protruding up from the floor, thrown there by the violence of the explosion. Cisco, Odo, and Dax had been very fortunate. But what about the workers who had been here? Where were they? Captain, he heard Odo call. I found talk, I think. That didn't sound good. Sisko ran to join the constable, preparing himself to see a shattered and perhaps unidentifiable body. Instead, he saw... What, the blazes? I believe it's talk, Odo offered, rising from where he was crouched. At his feet was a circular object about three and a half feet across. As he stared at it, Sisko realized what it was. He's rolled up in a ball, he exclaimed. All that was now visible of him were the plates from his shell, overlapped in a circle. A protective measure, no doubt, Odo growled. Probably instinctive, in fact. All of them must have curled up when the explosion went off. It probably saved their lives. Sisko nodded and bent over what was presumably torque. He rapped on the shell. It's safe to come out now, he called. I've tried that, Odo remarked. Nothing is getting through to him. He'll have to come out of this on his own. 
I doubt he can hear anything in that state, agreed Cisco. And he may even take my tapping his shell for further trouble. He glanced around. I guess he'll be safe enough here. There's no immediate danger from the fire. Let's see if we can find further survivors. Some may be in trouble. As he was about to hurry off, he remembered something. Do you still have your communicator? Of course, Odo replied. Contact the Defiant and get Kira to offer help to Dron. But tell her that on no account is she to beam anyone else over without permission. They'll have to use you to zero in on us. Both Dax and I have lost our badges. Understood. Odo tapped his communicator as he hurried off. Cisco ignored that aspect of things. Strangely, there was still no sign of rescue equipment or crews arriving, though there had been plenty of time. What was going on here? He was starting to get what seemed like a crazy answer to that question forming in his mind. He started to scan the streets and wreckage for further signs of the curled-up balls that were the hive dwellers. Now he knew what to look for. He could see several of them. Most were out of immediate danger, but some he had to grab and roll away from trouble and licking flames. Their shells were obviously tough, but he doubted that they could stand being baked. After about ten minutes, he had cleared as many as he could see. The wreckage of several trucks still blazed, and the smoke was getting worse. He found two of the aliens quite obviously dead. One had been caught in the blast, and his or her body was charred and shattered beyond hope. The second one had a length of steel rod impaled and extruding a foot and a half from its back. Thankfully, there were no further casualties that he could detect. He'd need a tricorder to discover any others, and Dax had the only one. He loped back through the throat-burning smog to where he had left her. Parts of the generator were scattered about, and she had her tricorder plugged deep within the generator's heart. Her left leg was extended stiffly behind her, and the trouser leg was even more soaked with blood. Deciding not to mention this, he asked gently, How's it going? This is it, she replied. The field is going to fail any second, unless my patchwork is right. Her head emerged from the machine, grimy and cut. She managed a wan smile. Here goes. She tapped in the command signal on the main panel, and the generator failed. There was a shriek of air as it was sucked through the void in the field. Wind tore at them both and started to drag off loose pieces of metal. I guess I got it wrong, Dax yelled over the din. She started tapping out further commands on the machine. You can't win them all, Cisco answered, holding on to the generator for support. A howling wind plucked at his clothing, trying to draw him up into the gaping maw above them. All around, small objects were crattering down the street toward the empty space and stars beyond. Better luck next time. I better win this, she replied, or there won't be any next time. Her fingers flew as fast as she could manage as she scanned the readout. Damn, that's what happened. I misdiagnosed the couplings. Given her medical condition, Sisko was hardly surprised, but he knew she wouldn't forgive herself. She managed to enter her new figures. And the wall was back in place where it should be. The wind died away, and all the debris fell back onto the ground with clashing and clattering. Sisko smiled at her. Well done, old man. Thank you, Benjamin. Pale and weak, she slid down the side of the machine. Sisko caught her and lowered her the rest of the way to the ground. How do you feel? he asked, concerned. The patch on her leg was wet with fresh blood. Marvelous, she said, and shook her head. I have felt better. Cisco glanced up and around. Odo, he yelled. Get over here now. Coming, Captain. A moment later, Odo sprinted out of one of the buildings, looking as fresh as he always did. He saw Dax lying on the ground and understood immediately. As he ran, he slapped his communicator. Odo to Defiant. Lock in on my signal. Two to beam up immediately to sickbay. Sisko jumped aside to allow Odo to scoop up Dax into his arms. Then the transporter beam took hold, and in a sparkle of light, both of them disappeared. 
Sisko stood watching the empty spot for a moment, and then he became aware of movement. He looked around and saw several of the hive aliens hurrying along the roads. They were all pushing what looked like floating stretchers. About time, he grumbled. Where have you been? One of them glared at him. We could not come in until the barrier was repaired, he snapped. We came as fast as we could. Then why didn't anyone come to repair the barrier? Sisko queried. You were very lucky my friend could accomplish the task. The repair crew was on its way, the alien answered. They could not reach here fast enough. Only one repair crew for the generator? Sisko couldn't believe it. Surely there are more. The alien gestured at the barrier. Considering what lies beyond that, he asked, shocked, we are fortunate to have even one crew. Sisko frowned. But all that lies beyond the barrier is space. Exactly. The medic hurried on to help with the injured. Sisko watched them at work, gathering up the fallen. All of the hive dwellers who had been here during the accident were still curled up in balls and had to simply be lifted onto stretchers to be moved. His suspicions were starting to clarify into certainty now. They were afraid of space. Two hours later, Sisko stood once again in the Hive Master's assembly room. Much of the confusion seemed to have settled down by now, but there was still plenty of action going on. Sisko had quietly gravitated to the rear of the room while Drawn took initial charge of the tidying up operations and then handed the task over to Industry Master Boran with clear instructions to get the work back on target once again. Sisko was piecing the information he'd been gathering together in his head and trying to work out exactly what was going on and how he could use whatever information he got out of this visit to the best advantage. He was still musing over possibilities when Odo returned. Dax will be fine, the constable reported, handing Sisko a new communications badge. She lost a lot of blood through her leg wound, but Dr. Bashir says we got her back in plenty of time. She'll just have to take it easy for a while. Which I doubt Dax will agree to, Sisko replied, clipping on his badge. He felt dressed again now. Anything else? Nothing that won't wait a while. Odo stared around the room. Has anything significant happened here? It's hard to say. I'm not in the loop, so to speak. Sisko nodded at the small clutch of hive masters at the end of the room. Drawn and his senior associates are conferring about getting their construction back online. And how is Torque? Sisko shrugged. No sign of him yet but I think we'd have heard if he were injured. There is one significant thing, though. He blinked. Ah, action at last. The group had broken up, and Drawn proceeded across the room to join Sisko and Odo. We owe you both our thanks, Drawn announced, obviously for everyone in the room to hear. Without your aid, the disaster might have been much worse. If there is any way we can repay you, there is, Sisko replied, without expecting much. Call off the move on Bajor. That, I am afraid, is impossible, Captain. Drawn spread his hands. Surely you realize that all our resources are being used up in forming the two hives. They must be replenished, and Bajor is the closest suitable world. We have no option but to absorb it. I wish that it were otherwise, but it is so. I see, Sisko frowned. I had hoped that our display of good intentions would influence your decision. Your help is very much appreciated, Captain, believe me, Drawn informed him. But we cannot change what must be. At that moment, the door Iris open and Torque hurried in. He appeared tired, drained, and still shaken, but there was a grim resolve in his eyes. Captain... He called loudly. Captain, I cannot possibly thank you enough for what you did. He hurried across and held out his hand and then stopped in confusion. My apologies. I was about to greet you as one of the hive 
and for a moment I forgot that you were not one of us. I'll bet, muttered Odo. You have, of course, no shell to stroke, Tork added. He looked about the room at his fellow hive masters. But in all other aspects you have proven yourselves beings with honor and great courage. I salute you as an equal. There was a murmur of comment at this. Some of the masters clearly didn't like the sound of that. The old hive master, Hosier, stepped forward from the bunch. An emotion I second, he said. Captain Sisko, Odo, and the unfortunately absent Lieutenant Dax have all acted well. They are clearly rational and compassionate beings. Dron looked more than a little put out by this, and Sisko could understand why. He had been publicly endorsed by two hive masters, and Dron would look foolish if he refused to listen to Sisko's arguments now. Apparently, at least two of the aliens were on his side. As I said, Dron said, catching the spirit smoothly, we owe you our thanks. You are welcome here at any time you wish. Now, on to important matters. He turned and beckoned Raldar to him. Security, Master Raldar, you have something to report, I believe. Indeed, agreed Raldar, bowing his head slightly. My men have been investigating the explosions of the three drones that began this state of emergency. They have discovered that the drones did not explode accidentally. Really? growled Odo. You're saying that someone sabotaged them? Raldar scowled back at him, obviously irritated that an outsider should be commenting. Yes, I am. And I believe we have uncovered the culprit. He gestured to one of the guards at the door, who then ushered in a young hive dweller. This is the worker Took, he explained. He was stationed close to the explosion site. He has relevant information the masters should hear. Proceed, Dron decided. Give your evidence. As you command. Took gave a low bow, not easy considering his shell. One of my co-workers has been speaking treason in my hearing, he told the assembled masters. He spoke of creating trouble to bring dissent into the hive and to attack the authority of the hive masters themselves. He works in the repair bays, and he recently completed work on the three drones that blew up. There was a murmur of outrage from the council. Who would dare do such an evil act, demanded Premon. What is the name of this deviant individual? His name is Harl, announced Took. Chapter 17 No, exclaimed Tork, shaken and clearly disturbed. I know Harl. He would never do such a thing. Dron scowled, wrinkling his snout. You claim that worker Took is lying, he asked. For what reason? I do not know his motives, Tork answered, sounding more confident now. But I do know Harl. Raldar snorted. And you claim he never spoke treason. This point told on Tork, who reeled as if struck. He spoke a lot of things, he admitted slowly. It is true that he has little love for the hive masters, but he loves the hive itself. He would never do anything to endanger us all. Raldar shook his head. Four people lost their lives in this act of sabotage, he growled. Machines and valuable resources were destroyed. Harl has been accused and must answer the accusation. Odo stepped forward. On what grounds? he asked skeptically. Raldar glared at him. Who gave you the authority to interfere in this, he demanded. I am the chief of security on Deep Space Nine, Odo answered. It is my task to uncover guilt and innocence. I would hardly do more than question a man on mere hearsay. He gestured at Took. Can anyone vouch for the truth of what this person says? Are there others who heard these threats of violence? Or is it simply his word against Harl's? Well said, Tork approved. 
Never has unsupported accusations been the base of a charge. Is there no more proof against Harl than this? We have the culprit himself, Raldar announced, clearly annoyed by what was happening. He gestured to the guards. Bring him in. Tork gasped as his friend was escorted in by two guards. Harl's hands were manacled together. Why is he being treated like this? he demanded. He is only accused and not convicted. He should not be restrained. Harl snorted. It is too late for logic, friend, he said. I have already been tried and convicted of this deed without proof and without being allowed to speak. John held up his hand. You are being allowed to speak now, he said dryly. I see you are already availing yourself of the right. Now, answer truthfully. Did you commit this sabotage? No, Harl said loudly and strongly. I did not. He asked me to, he added, pointing to Took, but I refused. He obviously went ahead and performed the deed himself and blamed me for it. A counter-accusation, Raldar sneered. It is only to be expected. There is also his comp, added Took. I discovered it near the site of the explosion. It has only his handprints on it, and it was the one used to detonate the explosives. Odo could stomach no more. Though he was only a guest on the hive, his passion for justice would not allow him to remain silent any further. Really? he asked sarcastically. Am I to understand that this young revolutionary here apparently used his own computer to trigger the bombs? He turned to Harl. That was terribly foolish of you, wasn't it? To use something that could be traced directly back to you so simply? You're either a very poor rebel, or you, he gestured at Took, are a very poor liar. You have no right, Raldar began, but Hosea raised his own voice. He has every right. He was there and endangered by the blasts. Besides, he makes sense. I wish to hear him out. So do I, added Tork. Please continue. In his element now, Odo did so. He glared at Took so ferociously the alien took a step backward. You found Harl's comp at the site of the explosion, did you? Yes, Took answered defiantly. Really? Odo turned to Tork. Do you have your comp with you? Of course. Tork pulled it from the niche in his shell. Why? Just prior to the explosion, Odo reminded him, you tried to contact Harl, didn't you? Where did your comp say that his comp was? Tork's face lit up as he realized what Odo was getting at. To the west of the site, he answered, well out of range of the explosion. Odo spun around. And you found it at the site, he growled. I wonder how it got there. Took appeared shaken and confused. You would say that he is innocent, he said to Tork. He is your friend, and probably your accomplice. Ah, Odo crowed. More accusations to cover a slip in your story, eh? That's not good enough. And another thing. You said that only Harl's prints are on the comp? Yes, Took answered defiantly. How do you know that? asked Odo. You could not have tested for prints, could you? Besides, wouldn't yours be on it, too, if you found it as you claim? Took was clearly shaken now. I suppose they would be, yes. Convenient. Odo surveyed the masters. And perhaps they were there before the explosion, too. So we have two sets of prints on the weapon, Harl's and yours. And you were the one discovered with the device, and which you claim you were turning in as evidence of Harl's guilt. Evidence you have no way of checking, surely. Raldar stepped forward. You are simply confusing the issue, he snapped, and you are harassing the witness. Witness? asked Odo, 
I'd say suspect would be a better word for it, wouldn't you? He whirled to face Drawn. I think there is at least as much evidence implicating Took in this matter as there is against Harl. Wouldn't you agree? Drawn clearly didn't want to make a decision about that. Well, he hedged. It does appear confusing. Confusing? Everyone's eyes turned to Hosea, who was seated at the main comp in the room. If you want to know what is really puzzling, I have just checked the determination records, and I confess myself bemused. Uh, what? asked Macon, stammering slightly. I do not see the, uh, relevance of the determination records. You do not see a great deal. That is your problem, Hosea informed him cruelly. I just looked up Witness Took there. It seems from his determination that he is not a worker at all. He feigned surprise. It says that he was assigned to security. He blinked mildly and then stared at Raldar. That means he works for you. Odd that you did not know this. I was reassigned, stammered Took, but the damage had been done. The other masters in the room stared alternately at him and at Raldar. Really? asked Hosea. And who changed your determination for you? Only a hive master could do that. He stared at his fellows one at a time. Anyone wish to confess to having changed Took's status for him? There was dead silence. I thought not. Happily, Tork said, I move that this matter be investigated more thoroughly, and that Took be taken to restraining cells for the time being, and that Harl be set free. And, he finished, glaring at Raldar, that Security Master Raldar give a full and sufficient explanation for this to the assembled masters. There was a surge of agreement with his motions, which Drawn cut short. What you say, he commented smoothly, is clearly only reasonable and just. He gestured to the guards who struck the manacles from Harl and transferred them to the protesting Took. Take him away. And you, Raldar, had better go as well. I shall want a full accounting of this from you at our next meeting. Raldar was scowling deeply and glaring at Tork, Odo, and Hosir in turn. Finally, he nodded. I obey, he growled in low tones, and then stalked from the room. Drawn turned to survey Tork and then Odo. It appears that this matter is more complicated than it first appeared, he said slowly. I thank you for your help. I suspect it will take some time for the truth to emerge. I'm sure it will. Odo agreed cynically. That's often the case in such matters. Tork turned to Odo and Sisko with a smile. Once again, I am in your debt, he said. You have saved the reputation and life of a friend. It seems to be becoming a habit, Sisko replied. If there is anything that I can do in return, Tork said simply, please name it. There is one thing, Sisko answered. You have kindly shown us some of the hive and answered many of our questions. I feel that I am beginning to understand your people. Now, perhaps, you will let me return the favor so that you may start to understand mine. Tork's snout wrinkled. I do not understand you. Accompany me back to Bajor, Sisko asked. See how they live. Try and understand why they will not leave their homes. There was a collective gasp at this suggestion, and Tork was clearly shaken by the suggestion. I'm sorry, Sisko said, feigning puzzlement. Have I offended in some way? He already had a good idea what the answer would be. Drawn moved forward. What you ask is absolutely impossible, he explained. Surely you must realize this. I'm sorry. Sisko replied, determined to make him spell it out. But I don't. 
Why is it impossible? When Dron didn't seem inclined to reply, Macharn stepped forward. Ah, uh, it is because we are too well adapted to our lives here inside the hive. Everything that is, uh, outside is non-essential and counter to our well-being. His earlier insight, Sisko realized, had been correct. He had guessed the reason for the non-transparent barrier, the lack of help the reaction of the non-injured hive members to no apparent threat. You can't stand space, he murmured. You can't be outside or look outside. Odo frowned. You mean this entire species is agoraphobic, he demanded. Yes, Sisko said. They are. That's why they view planet dwellers as insane. They can't cope with the concept themselves and declare the idea madness instead of their response. That is not true, Dron blustered. Our approach is rational. There is nothing wrong with any of us. Then prove it, Sisko said. Open a window into space. Look on the stars. Dron couldn't disguise his shudder of revulsion. That's disgusting. That's what I thought. Sisko glared around the room. It isn't the planet dwellers who are insane, he said gently. Has it occurred to you that you're the ones not facing up to reality? You can't say things like that about us, the cat yelled. We are not deviant in any way. Our way is the only true evolved way to live. Odo sneered. Really? How evolved, how true a life can you have hiding behind walls built from flimsy logic and half-truths? None of you has the courage to face the facts. I do, Tork swallowed and sighed. I will go with you to see Beju. What? The cat stared at his colleague in revulsion. You will allow yourself to be deluded by these aliens? No, Tork answered gently. This is my decision. The captain is correct. How can we understand the Bajorans if we are not willing to experience what they experience? Hosea laid a kindly hand on Tork's shell. But you are badly affected by the sight of the stars, he said. We all know that. You tried the experience once already and failed. Then I will try again, Tork replied. He was obviously unhappy, but determined. I cannot stand by and do nothing. Captain Sisko and his friends have proven their good intentions. Can we do any less? Sisko cleared his throat. It's a brave decision, he said with genuine sympathy. But is it a wise one? If you retreat into your shell again when you reach Bajor... Then you will learn nothing. I may have underestimated how difficult it is for all of your people. Perhaps this is not a wise idea. Kosir smiled slightly and gave Tork a significant look. It is not so for all of our people, Captain, he replied without turning. A small percentage of us can stare into space without ill effect. They are our astronomers. Clearly, his words meant something very significant to Tork. The alien's face lit up with delight and hope. Yes, he breathed. He turned to Dron. Grandmaster, I formally request your permission to accompany the captain back to the world of Bajor, to study it and report back to the hive masters in assembly. Dron had obviously been trying to understand what had been happening and to turn it to his best advantage. He scowled at the request, but clearly needed to reply. Are you sure that this is wise? He asked, playing for time. It may affect you very adversely. I know the risks, Tork answered with confidence. I am willing to undertake them. Dron glanced around the room, taking in the feelings of his fellow council members. 
Then I have little option but to grant your request, he decided. You will accompany the aliens and report back to us as soon as possible. If you are able, he added significantly. Thank you, Tork said. I shall endeavor to serve the hive to the best of my limited abilities. His snout twitched. There is one further matter. The possibility is that I may indeed become incapacitated by shock. Therefore, I request a companion to aid me who will not be so affected. Do you have anyone in mind? asked Hosier before Dron could say anything. Yes, Tork said. An astronomer named Sana. I know she is unaffected by agoraphobia. Makarn looked shocked. But she has only just passed her determination, he objected. She, ah, uh, has been assigned to Team 2 as an astronomer. The determination cannot be wrong. But it could, of course, be changed at the request of a hive master, for personal reasons, John said slyly. Sisko wasn't following this exchange, but there was obviously some kind of power play going on here. Drawn and Tork were clearly battling over something. This is not a personal request, Tork answered smoothly. Such a request for change of determination for selfish reasons would go against everything our society holds dear. As Makarn said, the determination is infallible, but it is not omniscient. He smiled at Hosea. What is that supposed to mean? demanded Makarn, frowning. Simply that the determination is made on the best possible data available, Tork replied, at the time of determination. He looked around the room. But the task of assistant to an ambassador to Bajor was not available at the time that Sana took her determination, so she could not have been appointed to the post. I believe that Sana is the person best suited to the task, and am willing to have her undergo a second determination in order to prove it. There was another round of shocked muttering in the room. There has never been a second determination, Primon protested. It is without precedent. So is this situation, argued Hosea. I, for one, move that we simply accept our colleague's recommendation. He is bravely risking his life and sanity to try and help in a difficult situation. One that none of us would volunteer to undertake he added significantly. His choice of assistant seems wise to me. Dron didn't appear to be happy with the direction in which the discussion was going, but he was obviously not intending to lose control. We do seem to be moving quickly in new directions, he commented. But as matters are very pressing, I for one will agree to forego a second determination for this sauna. Unless anyone has any serious objections, therefore, I am inclined to agree with our young colleague's request. Is there any dissent? Though Makon looked as if he might challenge the ruling, he subsided under one of Dron's withering glares. There was no other comment. Then it is agreed, Dron commented. He turned to face Sisko. You will accept full responsibility for the safety of our observers, he demanded. I will, Sisko agreed. I promise you all that I shall do everything in my power to keep both Tork and Sana safe. So be it, Dron turned to the Hive Masters. I believe that is quite sufficient for one meeting. We all have our duties to attend to. They all got the point of that message and began filing out of the room in clumps of two or three, all talking in low tones. After a moment, only Hosier, Tork, and Dron were left with Sisko and Odo. Hosier clapped Tork cheerily on the shell. I admire your courage, youngster, he commented. Before you leave, stop by and see me. And when you return, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. He inclined his head at Dron and then turned to Sisko. Captain, it has been very interesting. I hope that we shall meet again under less tense circumstances. 
Cisco liked the old alien. He was craftier than he seemed and was clearly playing some political games of his own. Likewise, he commented. Hosea nodded and then left the room. Torque bowed to Dron. Thank you for your wise decisions, Grandmaster, he murmured. I will endeavor to fulfill the trust you have placed in me. Dron nodded. Remember always that we serve the greater good of the hive, he said. Do not be swayed by emotion or appearances. Judge wisely and return in safety. Torque nodded and then led Sisko and Odo outside. I must inform Sana of the hive master's decision, he said. We should be ready to go with you in less than one of your hours, if that is acceptable. That's fine, Torque, Sisko answered. I'd better get back to my ship. Constable, would you be kind enough to wait here and then escort our guests to the Defiant? Of course. Sisko slapped his communicator. Sisko to Defiant. One to beam back. In the council chamber, Drawn crossed to the other door and Iris did open. Raldar stepped in, looking duly chagrined. I would hardly call that a clever scheme, Drawn snapped. Not only did you not succeed in placing the blame on Harl, but you even managed to implicate yourself in the business. What do you have to say for yourself? It was the fault of that alien, Odo, complained Raldar. If he had not interfered, then Hosir or one of the others would have, exclaimed Drawn. At least take the blame for your mistakes honestly. Harl is cleared, and you yourself are seen in a poor light. He considered for a moment. It might be better if that idiot Took were not around to create further problems. Raldar nodded. I fear that he might just take his own life out of guilt and remorse for what he has done. That sounds more than plausible, agreed John. The hive master slumped onto a seat. Perhaps we can then allow the matter to fade in memory, especially with the formation of the second hive. There are more important matters to consider than one foolish worker with a grudge. He started tapping out commands on his comp. The division will go according to plan. The masters will be split between the two hives. You will remain with me on Hive 1. The cat will be Grand Master of Hive 2. That was to have been my hive, exclaimed Raldar angrily. You had agreed. That was before this fiasco, Drawn snapped. You have shown yourself lacking in good judgment. If you redeem yourself, and I say again, if, then you will become my successor. Otherwise, you will become nothing. Do you understand me? Fighting to control his anger and disappointment, Raldar managed a curt nod. Good. And what of Tork? asked Raldar, more subdued. He has escaped both traps you laid for him. You have been listening at doors again, I see. Dron's snout wrinkled in irritation. True. Tork has proven to be more flexible than I had expected. Obviously, Hosier favors the youth. Raldar sneered. Out of anger over losing the Grand Master post to you, he suggested. He never desired it, Dron snorted. Hosier is bright and cunning, but he lacks ambition and drive. Until recently, he has never gone against me in any decision... I think his shell has finally started to firm up. Hosea sees Tork as his protege and wishes to groom him to be everything that he never had the nerve to become. There was a thoughtful look on Dron's face. Even if I do wish you to be my successor, you may face a challenge from Tork. He is barely more than a child, protested Raldar. But an intelligent one, thundered Dron. And unless you show yourself to be cleverer than you have today, he will become the next Grand Master. You have to apply yourself. Raldar bowed again. As you say, he agreed, trying to sound submissive. 
May I ask why you allowed him to accompany the aliens? Surely you cannot be thinking of allowing him to change your objectives. Do not even think such thoughts, Dran snarled. The great design will go forward, even if we have to wipe out a dozen worlds. No, he continued in a more calm vein. I allowed Tork to go for one simple reason. When the aliens cannot dissuade us from our course, they will obviously hold Tork hostage to try and force us to change our plans. They will threaten to kill him if we proceed. We will never allow such perfidious behavior to affect our destiny, and we will refuse. They will kill him. When they do that, Tork will become a martyr to our people and he will cease to be a problem to you and me. Better a dead martyr than a live problem. Valdar nodded. You have thought it all out clearly, he said in admiration. The great design will succeed. Of course, Dran stood up. Now I must rest. This has all been fatiguing. See to Took and wait for my call. The time for action has come. Chapter 18 It felt good to be back on the Defiant. The Hive had been fascinating and even more than a trifle enviable. If only DS-9 had some of the facilities that were available on that ship. Sisko smiled ruefully. Sometimes the Spartan nature of Deep Space Nine made him wish that he were assigned to either a starship or a starbase... Then came a challenge such as this, and he knew he was where he was meant to be. Still, he had several calls to make, none of which were likely to be pleasant. When he reached his ready room, the first one he placed was to Admiral Noguchi. The old man managed a thin smile. I hope you have good news to report, Captain. I wish I had, sir, Sisko replied. The Hive Masters are still intent on making Bajor their next target, and nothing I've managed to do so far has convinced them to change their minds. However, one of the Masters, Tork, is accompanying me back to Bajor to study the situation for himself. I believe he is sympathetic, and I hope that I can win him over to our side. Noguchi nodded. But will one lone voice for us affect them? Frankly, I'm not sure. Sisko admitted, but there's very little hope otherwise. I understand, Captain. Noguchi drew himself up straight. Then Starfleet's orders are clear. If you cannot persuade the Hive to change its plans, you must do all within your power to stop them. We cannot allow these intruders to devastate another planet, particularly not Bajor. Is that clear, Captain? perfectly. Even though he had been expecting the command, it still disturbed Sisko. They are not a bad people, Admiral. I hope we can negotiate a peaceful settlement. So do I, Captain, Noguchi said fervently. Starfleet wants nothing more than peace, but we cannot allow a planet-wrecking society to remain at large in this galaxy. He glanced at his pad Relief will not be with you any faster, he apologized. This one is on your shoulders, Benjamin. I'm sorry. So am I, Admiral, Sisko admitted. But it's part of my job. He signed off, feeling weary. That communication had been bad enough, but he was dreading the next one. A few moments later, Gull Ducat's supercilious smile greeted him. Captain, allow me to congratulate you on your recent promotion. It couldn't have happened to a better human. Thank you, Ducat, Sisko answered. But this is not a social call. I assume you have been briefed on the situation in the Durain system by your ship that's sitting here watching. Ducat inclined his head slightly. You mean the tragic destruction of Durain 4 and the appalling loss of life with it. Sadly, yes. He spread his hands. I wish I could help, but complications have arisen, and there is little we can do but 
offer condolences. You'd better save them for your own people, Sisko told him, and was slightly pleased to see the smug expression wiped off the Cardassian's face. What do you mean, Captain? Sisko hedged for a moment. Do you know what is happening to the Hive at this moment? Ducat glanced away for a few seconds and then back. It appears to be suffering some kind of splitting process, he replied. My observers think it may be fissioning into two separate craft. Your observers are quite correct, Sisko confirmed. In two days, there will be two identical hives, each with the capacity and appetite of the first hive. That is unfortunate, Ducat answered. Then the point sank home, and he scowled into the screen. Appetite? You mean that the two hives will be seeking further worlds to plunder? Precisely. One of the hives is targeting Bajor. Ducat clucked his tongue. That's a shame. I assume that the Federation will be protecting their ally. We will be doing everything that we can, Sisko extemporized. What should interest you more is that the second hive will be heading for Cardassia Prime. That completely wiped the last vestiges of his smugness away. What? If it was possible for a Cardassian to look paler, Ducat managed that astounding feat. Cardassia Prime? Your hearing is excellent. Sisko leaned forward. I wish we could offer you assistance, but under the circumstances. He spread his arms. Given their level of technology, Ducat, I'd strongly advise you to try and talk to these people to avoid a war. Thank you for your concern, Captain, Ducat managed to say, looking very pained. But we know best how to look after our own interests. Thank you for this information. Now, I believe I had better discuss this matter with my colleagues. The screen went blank. At least I managed to shake him up a bit, Sisko thought. But the Cardassians were in a much better position to meet this threat head on than Bajor was. Cardassia had three fleets stationed within two days of the homeworld at all times. Maybe they would stand a chance if it came down to a war with the Hive. Bajor had no such forces. The only things that stood between it and the Hive were the Defiant and Deep Space Nine, and there wasn't a great deal of firepower concentrated between the two of them. He could put off his next call no longer. A moment later, he was looking into the troubled eyes of Shakar. The First Minister grimaced slightly. It's too much to hope for good news, I imagine, he said. I'm afraid so, agreed Sisko. The Hive Masters remain firm in their intentions. However, I will be bringing one of their number with me back to DS9 and then on to Bajor. He is willing to listen to whatever you have to say. I think he is sympathetic to our point of view, and we may be able to win him over. End of Side 4